I love coming to church. I love being with the family of God. Amen. It is a privilege. It is an honor to be here for the very first time in Vider, Texas. If I'm saying the name of the community correctly, Vider. Someone, someone said, you're going to Vider. I go, I don't think it's pronounced Vider. I'm pretty sure it's not Vider, but I, so I was right. I have to let that person know they were wrong. It's Vider. Amen. What a wonderful, wonderful opportunity to be here. I give honor to your pastor and to all those that are working tirelessly behind the scenes, probably for weeks on end to get everything together. And I can assure you that all the labor, all the work that you have been putting into it is going to be worth it all. It's going to be worth it all. Before I get into the word, I, it is just a custom for me to introduce my family Typically, one of them is with me when I go somewhere if it's more than a day. If not, keep them grounded back home. But I, I love my family very much. That is South Dakota, the beautiful landscape of South Dakota. They say there's a pretty woman behind every tree. And there's three trees in South Dakota. My wife and my two daughters. And I love, love them. My son Noah, he is 30 years old, my daughter Grace, she is 11 years old, my daughter Eden, she is 8 years old, and my wife is forever young, and uh, this past December, we celebrated 19 years of marriage, and so I give honor to my wife, I say this everywhere I go, and it is not vain repetition. It is a sense of accountability for me and to let people know the significance of who it is that you marry. And one of the moments I heard the near audible voice of God is when he said, if it was not for your wife's covering, you would be in hell right now. And uh, I thank God for a praying wife, a godly wife, a consecrated wife who exhibits and embodies the spirit of holiness. And I love and give her honor today. I also bring greetings from South Dakota. I don't know if they have our, our current temperatures up there, but just want you to know where I'm coming from and where I'm going back to. I told Pastor, if I get stranded in Vider for the weekend, I wouldn't be too upset. Um, so it's a, little, it's a little cold over there. And uh, those are... Those aren't feel-like temperatures. You know, everyone talks about feel-like temperatures. That really is a temperature in South Dakota. It really is that cold. And um, amen, amen. If you have your Bibles, you can reach for those. We're going to turn into the word of the Lord. Give honor to all the missionaries that are here. I wish I could memorize everyone's name easily and say them, but those weren't easy names for me to repeat. But I give honor to all the missionaries, our regional director, uh, Brother Tuttle, and uh, this is just an awesome, awesome moment and opportunity to be with you. I have a special place in my heart for missions conferences. Anytime I'm presented the opportunity to go, I take it seriously. And um, I believe the Lord wants to do a great work this evening and the following and at the culmination of it on Sunday. We're going to the book of Matthew chapter 5. We're going to start at verse 38. And read on down through verse 48, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 38. If you're there, say amen. If you're not, say woman. If you're not going to laugh, I can't help you. That's a condition you have, and I love you. Verse 38, Jesus speaking here. He said, you have heard that it has been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. If someone mistreats you, you mistreat them back. If someone punch you in the face, you punch them right back. But Jesus says, I say unto you, resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite you on your right cheek, turn to him the other also. You're going to do the opposite of what your nature wants to do. If a man's going to sue you at the law, take away your coat and let him have your cloak also. 
And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. It is said in those days that, you know, the Romans who had the rule and the jurisdiction over the Jews that conquered that region, that area, that if they didn't want to carry something, whether it be groceries, whether it be armor, whether it be just random sack of bricks, they could point to some Jew and say, you carry this. And they were obligated by law to carry that for a mile. And once they met their minimum expectations, they were released. But Jesus said, don't stop at a mile, go the extra mile. Give to him that asked you, and from him that would borrow of you, turn not thou away. You've heard it. That's been said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he makes the sun to rise on the evil and on the good. He sends rain on the just and on the unjust. If you love them which love you, what reward have you? Do not even the publicans do the same. Is your behavior any different than the average sinner? If you salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? It's a pretty provoking statement there that Jesus asked what do ye more than others are you any different than any everyone else is your behavior your action your spirit your attitude any different than anyone else I know a lot of people like to use that verse that Paul said compare the person that compares themselves among themselves is not wise And there is a truth in that principle statement at face value. But if you actually expound on that context, Paul's not against comparison because he uses himself as a comparison. What he's against comparing is using the wrong standard to compare yourself. That's a whole other message. But what do we do? We are to be perfect even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect well God's not asking a lot of us is he I want you to be perfect just like God's perfect you know some people against the message of holiness think it's a legalism too high of expectation but the only reason why we preach holiness is because the word declares be holy for I the Lord your God am holy For him to require it means we can aspire to it. In other words, we could not do it. And so when God begins to make a decree that things need to be a certain way in our lives, that means God makes a provision for us to rise to the occasion. We sir, I've been going through homeschool with our children and reading through different literature and books, going through some history on, on Greek mythology. I'm so thankful our God is nothing like Greek mythology. We serve a God who is perfect, not deified carnality. We're talking about a perfect God who is merciful, compassionate, slow to anger, quick to forgive. What do ye more than others? And whoever compels you to go a mile, go with him twain. I want to speak just for the next few moments here tonight with the help of the Lord about more than a little. More than a little. Would you pray with me that God's will would be done here in the conclusion of this service tonight? God, I thank you for the privilege 
the honor, the opportunity to be gathered together here in Vider, Texas with Eastgate and the family of God. I thank you for the missionaries that are here tonight. I give them honor. I speak the blessing of the Lord upon them. God, as they take a moment, Lord, away from their field of labor, Lord, their labor of love, I pray this would be a weekend of ministry for them. I pray you put virtue back into their spirit, into their mind, into their soul. I pray, God, that you ready our hearts, Jesus. I pray that we would take heed how we hear. I pray you give us ears to hear and a mind to perceive and a heart, God, to receive, a mind to comprehend. I I said a spirit of revelation would enter into this room. And in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray that you open up the windows of heaven, roll back the roof of this church, fixate a ladder between heaven and earth. I pray that the angels of God would ascend and descend upon this congregation. And I ask that your kingdom would come. I pray that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven, God. Not my will, but thy will. I pray in the name of Jesus that I would decrease so that you can increase tonight. In the name of Jesus, be glorified, be magnified, be lifted high. I love you, God. You're wonderful. I love you, God. You're worthy. I give you praise and adoration. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ, would you clap your hands to the Lord, and would you let your voices be louder than your applause right now? Would you allow your voices to rise above the crescendo of your applause? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord more than a little. I'm so thankful to live in this, this dispensation of grace, as some would call. I'm thankful not to be in the Old Testament, and we could speak the rest of this service as to why I am thankful not to be in the Old Testament. One, no dwarf could be a minister, and so I'm thankful to be in the New Testament today. I'm allowed to minister because of God's grace. I thank God that we can eat bacon in the New Testament. I thank God for all of the... I, mean, I, I, I wouldn't be able to function in the Old Testament. I'm kind of an animal lover. I don't go hug trees, and I don't just eat vegetables. I, I'm, I'm very carnivorous. But uh, I just could not be the one to bring a sacrifice and slit its throat. I could not do that. I am thankful to live in this New Testament dispensation because of the blood of the Lamb. But sometimes people mistake that the New Testament means it's easy, cheesy, lemon squeezy. There's really uh, no expectation. You know, you're just kind of free to do whatever you want. We do believe come as you are, but we do not believe stay as you are. We believe that the love of God loves us so much he doesn't leave us like he found us. We serve a God who transforms us. We don't have to be conformed to this world. We can be transformed by the renewing of our mind. But it's important for us to understand, though we are blessed in this, this season, this window of grace, it is, it is a higher level of living. It is a higher level of expectation. In the Old Testament, it was the physical act that was wrong. Jesus comes along in the New Testament. He says, I tell you, it's the visual act that is wrong. He says, you know, as he speaks in Matthew chapter 5, verse 27 through 30, to physically be in sexual relations before a marriage or outside of a marriage, it is sin. This is what Jesus said. And he said, you know, the physical act is wrong, but I want you to know it's more than the physical act. I want you to understand it is the lust of the eye that is sinful and causes someone to commit adultery inside of their heart. We know that murder is wrong, as was declared in the Old Testament. And so you could be mad you could be upset with someone. You could beat the ever-loving daylights out of them. But as long as they have a pulse, you're okay. 
But Jesus says, no, you, you can't even swing. You can't throat punch them. You can't, you can't karate chop them. You can do nothing to them. In fact, I, I want you, you can't even speak behind their back. You tell me which one is harder, holding back your fist or holding back your tongue. So don't tell me that, you know, because we live in the New Testament, it's, it's a whole lot easier and we can just kind of relax. No, it is a higher level of living. But it is impossible to accomplish it in our flesh. It can be only accomplished by God's grace, by His Spirit that can transform this carnal nature. And so Jesus began to help introduce this. If you did nothing but read Matthew 5, 6, and 7 the rest of the year, and that was your Bible reading, you are going to live a very transformed life. You are going to have some paradigm shifts in your mind. People have this idea of what the Sermon on the Mount is. You got this beautiful, fair-skinned Jesus and long, flowing hair and blue sash and all this kind of stuff and just speaking very calm and very delicate. The, these, these words in Matthew 5 and Matthew 6 and Matthew 7 are anything but without edge. There, there is quite a cut to it. There is quite conviction to it. And I thank God that He loves us so much to just speak to us very real and transparent. And it's because He doesn't want to leave us like He found us. And so Jesus is helping them to understand, look, you know that, that all these rules and all these regulations, but I'm telling you there's some things that we need to do in this new season that we need to go the extra mile when someone asks you to go to one mile. What do ye more than others? Now, I know some of you are probably trying to figure, you know, who's this hobbit talking to you today and you got your defense mechanisms up with me. I don't assume you know anything about my life, so I'll just give you a quick backdrop of who I am. I, I, I'm, I'm 39 years old, and I stand 39 inches tall. And so as a 39-year-old, my wife and I, we got married when we were 20. And then at age 22, God called us to go to South Dakota to plant a church. I don't know if you have a picture of that white building with blue trim. Beautiful, beautiful building. And uh, that, that, that's, that's where we moved into. That's where we started uh, and we didn't have an ever-loving clue what we were doing, but it was a split-level home, and we, we lived inside the basement there. And to give you an idea how, how uh, it's like a crawl space down there, I could almost touch the ceiling just to let you know how little that basement was. And so that's where we, that's where we slept. That was our beautiful dungeon with long, shagadelic carpet. And uh, when we moved there, we didn't have any furniture. We slept on the carpet. Our aunts were there to comfort us. And I talk about the bugs, not our relatives. And um, so it was a beautiful, bright beginning in South Dakota. I'm from Chicagoland area, so it was, it was a, little, a little different from Chicago to South Dakota. In Chicago, we hold our guns like this. In South Dakota, it's a little different, a little adjustment along the way. But that, that's where we began, and we, we would have church upstairs. And, and, um, and so I've been in South Dakota for 17 years in the church planting process. And I, I, I just want to give you a little insight tonight of what this weekend is all about. Perhaps most of you already know what this weekend is about, but perhaps some of you are new to this. You don't fully understand this is your first missions conference. Or maybe this is your, your 30th missions conference that you've been a part of. But it's, it's good every now and again to be reminded why we are gathering on a Friday night, why you're going to gather again on a Saturday and then a Sunday morning and a Sunday evening because missions is the heartbeat of God. I give honor to our missionaries that have went across the pond and they're, they're in foreign territory, but I want you to also realize this, that there's very foreign territory in North America. South Dakota is one of those places. To give you just a little idea and understanding about South Dakota. This may shock some of you uh, 20th generation apostolics of Texas. Is South Dakota is a non-Pentecostal culture. When we went out there, you know, it, there was eight churches and then another one closed and went down to seven, then another one closed and went down to six. There were six churches in the entire state. Now some of you guys probably have six churches on this block. 
I was I was just into I think De Quincey, Louisiana, a few weeks ago, and and here's this big old church, and right across the street was another big old church, and the town was like a town of I don't know two thousand people, and they had like four Pentecostal churches in this town of like a thousand people. It was mind boggling. Uh, there, there's more people in this room than there is in the state of South Dakota. But when we went out there, and the nearest fellowship, our nearest neighbor was a hundred miles away, and, and that, that was their typical distance you would have to travel to find apostolic fellowship. The culture out there is Lutheran; it, it, it rules the day out there, and and after Lutheranism is Catholicism, then everything else. But Pentecost is non-existent. It is what they would term as something that is very cultic they are anti anything that branches away from lutheranism and catholicism and i think of a story in your bible found in first samuel chapter 22 verse 1 and 2 we read about a man named david and he goes to this cave called adulam and he's there with his brethren in his father's house sometimes that's all you can get to come to church when you're starting a church is the sympathy of your family to come and say it's going to be all right we're with you and then verse 2 it says everyone that was in distress everyone that was in debt everyone that was discontent and they gathered themselves to David and he became captain over them and pretty much this might be the first record of a church plant in your Bible everyone in debt everyone that's in distress and everyone that is discontent that's pretty much the genesis of a church plant it's pretty much the genesis of a foreign field in a work that you are starting but here's the reality if you are willing to work with people that are in debt and you are willing to take in people that are in distress and you are willing to counsel those that are discontent you can accumulate more than just a couple people at the conclusion and culmination of this verse, we read that David had 400 of these people. I pray we never stop as an established apostolic work reaching for those that are in debt those that are in distress and those are discontent we ought not get content with ourselves and just celebrate ourselves because now we know how to have professional Pentecost and have just the right service without any nuisance in the name of Jesus I believe in Viter and in surrounding areas there's still people that are distressed there are still people that are discontent and it's going to take the church right here that God has to reach out to the people out there. A little behind the back maneuver there. Someone say amen. amen. David was leading these people. David was their leader. He was their captain. But I have learned this about numbers. Though you can celebrate 400, not all numbers mean the same thing. Not all numbers are equal. I, I've seen, I know people that they be pastoring over 100 people, but they're still having to work multiple jobs because it's 100 people that, you know, operate with EBT. And then I know people that have 10 people but they can be full time, full focus, because also those ten people just have to have, happen to have deep pockets. Not all numbers mean the same thing. You can have a church of five hundred, but there's no depth in prayer. But you can have a church of twenty five that knows how to pray and get a hold of God. We can't get just caught up in numbers. We must have substance. We must train. We must cultivate. We must raise up disciples that are driven to have a deep, meaningful, substantive walk with God. And I'm believing by your leadership. I, I celebrate the size of this church, but I believe there's depth to this church. It's very apparent walking in here just being able to pray. Sometimes I really got to strain to feel anything in the presence of God. But I thank God that there's a witness of the Holy Ghost in this place. 
And missions work is so significant. I would not be here. None of us would be here if there was not a beginning, a genesis, a missions work. My mom was in a gang. She went to prison for attempted manslaughter. My mom and dad were addicted to cocaine, world falling apart. But one day, they were invited to a rinky dinky, stinky little Pentecostal church. My mom, who was Catholic, my dad, who was Baptist, they knew nothing about this. But my mom, who's been in prison, my mom, who, who, who was trying for attempted manslaughter, she walked into that building and she was shaken and holding that chair, not knowing what to do. But I thank God she let go of that chair my mom and dad came forward there was no big projector there was no beautiful greenery there was no wireless sound there was no fancy seating but the presence of God was in that room and on that day God filled my father with the Holy Ghost my mom and dad got baptized in Jesus name and they were forever transformed they never went back to cocaine they never went back to alcohol they never went back to marijuana they're still married they're still living for God I'm in the church my brother's in the church we're both pastoring I'm telling you there's no telling what can happen from a mission work hallelujah I don't remember how old I was I was just a wee little lad and, and, and my, my, my Mexican mom was from Tijuana, Mexico and so we, I won't good majority of our Christmases and New Year's were in Mexico. We'd drive from Chicago to Tijuana to Rosarito, California. And we'd go there for our Christmas break and, and, uh, and, and I'd basically just sit and watch everyone speak Spanish and get wasted. But man, the food was good. That's all that mattered. But one time my, my, my abuelita, my, my grandma, she came out and she visited us there in Chicagoland area and we, we had to find a Spanish work. And the only thing my mom can find, it was some missions work inside of a school. And I already hate school. And now we're going to school for church. And I mean, it is weird. And I, we're, I've never been to church inside of a school before. And it's a, it's a really weird feeling going into an empty school. And we're in an empty school. And we're sitting in a classroom in chairs. And, and it was the most backwards, awkward, weird service going on. But in that service, my little, my little Wella, she just started shaking. God filled with the Holy Ghost. She got baptized in a horse trough in Jesus' name. I, I am thankful for the mission field. But I remember as a kid, I'm like, man, I, I don't ever want to be one of those weird mission works. Those people are weird, backward. All of a sudden, God calls my wife and I to go live in that white thing uh, back there, and and we're living in a basement. And all of a sudden, now we've come full circle. We are the weird ones, and we there was not a big support group, so we didn't look weird. We just we were weird, and it was awkward. If they got that picture again, like when people come visit. You know, the, those double doors are like these ghetto jank metal doors. I remember the first time we had our first guest speaker. We're having service inside. He was running late, and he couldn't get in the building, and we couldn't get out the building. <laughs> the doors weren't working, but we just kept praying anyways. But it was so awkward because, you know, that... that the, all, all the other churches in the community, they, they have that, that beautiful cathedral look and feel to it. And you tell people that's a church, you're like, what in the world? And they're already, they're already a little apprehensive to go anyways. And so when they open that door, when you'd open those two double white doors, you, you'd have to adjust your eyes because you're walking into a darker environment. And when you walk into there and your eyes are adjusting as they're still seeing blotchy pieces of black as you're rubbing them out, all of a sudden you hear this, uh, 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 or someone yelling da, 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 da. and if they can make past that awkward moment and their eyes could adjust immediately looking left would be this tremendous ascent of like a 45 degree angle staircase of like eight steps and when they would turn and see, they would just see people's ankles and cankles. Because the chairs were right there. 
And I, 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 when I would be preaching or I'd, I'd be leading song service with my guitar and singing, I'd just fake it to make it because there's no one else to do it. We're doing everything. And, and I, I saw the door open and, and all of a sudden I'm just waiting for like a head to pop up. But if I didn't see a head pop up, I know what was happening. But if, sometimes I would get to see the tops of their heads. And then they would look over and you see their eyes just over the pews. And they scurry off. I lost count of how many times people walked out of that building. It was absolutely embarrassing. It was absolutely frustrating. But we had passion. We had zeal. We were determined. We're going to break the spirit of that area. We're going to have apostolic revival. We're going to stand at the gates of hell. And they're not going to prevail against the church of the living God. In the beginning, it was just I'm preaching to my wife and one other person, and we had this ghetto jank sound system. I don't even know why we had a sound system. Didn't even need one. You know, this, this platform's like twice the size, three times the size of our sanctuary in that building. And so I, I, our our, pla- our platform, I'm standing there with this ghetto sound system, and I'm preaching, and it sounded just like a kazoo. <laughs> You can only tell your wife to repent so many times. <laughs> Get frustrating after a while. I'm sure David was encouraged. Some people coming in. Now he's got a gathering of people doing what he can, but he's still, he's not fulfilling what he felt God told him to do. To be the king, to be on the throne to be leading the people of God, to have a revival in the nation of God. And now we read David just a chapter later, 2 Samuel 23, 14. David's in a hold. The garrison in the Philistines was there in Bethlehem. And David begins to long. He begins to reminisce. He begins to think about how things used to be before he is in the predicament he is currently in. Because he wasn't always on the run. He wasn't always a fugitive. He wasn't always hiding. He wasn't always surrounded by discontent people. He wasn't surrounded by distressed people. Sometimes just being around your pets is a lot easier. Hanging out with the sheep. You know, it was a lot more comfort. They didn't talk back. He just played his harp and he could worship God. There was no really other responsibility than that. But now people, it's a whole other level. It's a whole other level of management. And I don't know what caused him to crack, but all of a sudden he snaps and he begins to think about what it was like. And he reminisces and he says, oh, that one would give me drink of the water of the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. I have have a colorful imagination. Anytime I'm reading the Bible, I kind of just immerse myself in the scriptures to get a better grasp or understanding of what's going on and I just kind of think about being in that scene in that cave with David and 400 men and all of a sudden these 400 men these are some bad mamma jammas these they they they, they, they kill people they, they 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 take over areas they're always fighting they're always warring they're always raging they're always out doing that and now they're in their cave and here's their fearless leader and they can hear him say I want some water I'm thirsty. Can you imagine? This, this, is, this is supposed to be your general, the captain of your salvation. And you, 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 you left everything you know, and here you are with all these men, and you're trying to do his bidding. Now you hear him saying, I'm thirsty. Now, not only am I thirsty, but I, I want the water at Bethlehem. And not just any water at Bethlehem I want the one by the gate it's like those people with highfalutin water oh when I was your age we drank from the water hose at the side of a house I grew up that way 
we had this weird thing called actual reality. We were outdoors doing our hood rat thing, running around, and we just walk up next to a house, open the spigot. There, there was no water, like galvanized, corroded, rubber, rust, water going. That's why I'm still standing. I build up immunity. I remember the first time drink I never even heard a bottle of water and someone handed me a bottle of water what's this I bottle of water I drank it I was like Pfft. it it didn't have the minerals it didn't have the texture what is that then you ask a preacher you know anything we can help you with well, I want Fiji water. Oh, the preacher wants some Fiji water. Here's these 400 men hearing their leader. I, I want some water from Bethlehem, from Bucky's, <laughs> on the east side of Bucky's, the one on the top shelf, pronounced Voss. <laughs> That's the one. You know how irritated you can be being one of those men that wield a sword and fight enemies, stare people in the eye, cut their throat, throw them down, take their... And that's your leader. You got to be very careful that you do not get a critical spirit when your leader begins to voice vision, passion, or desire. Take heed how you hear. I don't know how loud David was. I don't know if all 400 in the cave heard it reverberating and echoing through the every nook, cranny, and corridor of each cavern that was there. But there was at least three that heard it. And I believe probably they are able to hear it because they were close enough to their leader. In this church, you want to go places, you got to get close to the voice of your leader. You don't want to be at the opposite end of the cave. You don't want to be at the opposite end of this church. You want to get to the heart of this church. You want to be part of the core of this church. You want to be in the center of what is being voiced, what is being longed for, and what is being desired. I remember as we started breaking down, we, we, we went to Watertown with zeal, passion, fire. We had no plan. I, I, and there wasn't, we didn't have the launch, you know, anything. We didn't have a team of 82 people go with us and have a 401k and a retirement plan. And we didn't get any of that. We just went, we didn't have a job. We didn't know we were working. We got there in our 89 Fox Volkswagen and Chevy Cavalier. And we had nothing. And it took me three months to find work. And then for eight years, I worked two jobs. I wish I'd tell you I was rolling in the bucks, but I worked at Starbucks, so I made no bucks. Dude wearing an apron, how fearless is that? Want to come to my church? we are trying to reach people and, and all that we're passionate we're zealous we're going after but after a while things start getting at you people are leaving it was seven years before one person got the Holy Ghost in a service that I preach this is why you got to know what you believe. Other words, you will let outcome change doctrine. No, every time someone didn't get the Holy Ghost, I went back to the book. It's still there. It is written. Preach another Sunday. No one get the Holy Ghost. 
I go back to the book. I can't change this book. I, I can't change the outcome, but I'm not changing the message. And if I stick with the message, God will back up his word. God will come through. I, I didn't feel the fire and the zeal and the passion for seven years of depression. I, I had mental breakdown. I, I go through some God awful stories. I, I literally have, have fell down in front of my wife after having someone chew us out and yell at us and begin to scream that this church will never grow because of what we teach and what we preach. And I'm laying there on the floor in front of my wife, shaking, having spittle come out of my mouth. And all I can say is, God, I'm trying. God, I'm trying. God, I'm trying. You may have heard me say this at some point, maybe somewhere, but I, I tell people the hardest Bible study I ever taught in my life was when it wasn't on holiness, it wasn't on the oneness, it wasn't on new birth. It was simply teaching my wife and I a Bible study so we didn't feel bad about using some funds from the church to get something to eat because we had no food. It was, it was the kind of poor where you eat cereal with a fork just to save milk kind of poor. I remember sitting, not being able to make ends meet, sitting in my car. I drove up to social services, and I'm looking at social services, and I'm, I'm contemplating going in because I can't, even, I can't even make enough to provide for family. The whole time I'm sitting in my car, I could, I could hear the voice of my father saying, don't you ever walk through the doors of that building with an able body. I'm not coming against anyone that's ever walked through the doors of social service. I'm just giving you a backdrop to my upbringing. And that's going through my mind. And I have an able body and I'm working two jobs. I'm still not making it. And I had to humble myself and walk through those doors and fill out that paperwork. I'm not here giving you some theory. I'm telling you some experience of what it is that you are a part of and what you are helping to accomplish across North America and overseas. Because that entire time, they, they, those people thought I was crazy. Every Sunday I'm trying to preach. I, it was a struggle for me to peel myself off that bed. I would lay there on Saturday night and the entire time in a pitch black room with no windows, I I would stare at this ceiling because above it that ceiling is about where I would stand to preach and the last thought on my mind before I went out into sleep was I don't want to wake up I don't want tomorrow to come and then when I would wake up and I saw that ceiling the first thought on my mind is I can't wait for this day to be over and once that day was over I immediately went down those stairs back into that bed put those sheets over and just went into a cycle of depression. It's a real thing. You ought to be praying for your missionaries. You ought to be praying for your church planners. They need more than money. They need prayer. They need intercession. They need you to stand in the gap. They need you to call their names before the Lord on Monday, on Tuesday. They're fighting real spirits in real depression. And I would try to preach. I would faith it all I could. And I, I remember just longing, man, I would like to be back home. I grew up in a church in the south side of Chicagoland area, a place called Harvey, Illinois. Terry Cox was preaching, and there we were in the ghetto. And he was a powerful preacher, and there was powerful demonstrations of the Holy Ghost, and you could feel the Shekinah glory of God Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, going to IBC for four years. Pastor Paul Mooney's in his prime. You got a, a 200 voice choir. You're going to church seven times a week, every week. You're surrounded with people your age, around 250 of them that are all wanting to take over the world for Jesus. It's a pretty electric atmosphere to be a part of every day for four years. Years, but then you remove yourself from that atmosphere and you're dropped into another zone, another realm that doesn't have breakthrough, that doesn't have deliverance, that doesn't have freedom. That is, I, I couldn't ride the coattails of someone else's consecration. I couldn't lean on someone else's praise and worship. I had to create the atmosphere. I had to create the prayer closet. I had to... Come on, don't just be a thermometer in the house of God. Be a thermostat that changes the temperature in this room. Don't rely on someone else to shout. Don't rely on someone else to dance. You can dance. You can shout. You can create atmosphere. Oh. 
But I longed. I longed the time. Multiple times I tried to quit. Multiple times I tried to walk away because I longed for the water at the wells of Bethlehem. I've been to Bethlehem and I had the water. I had the water. I drank of it in Harvey, Illinois. I had the water. I drank of it at Calvary Tabernacle. I had the water when I would be at some conference or some camp and all of a sudden the presence of God would come in like a river and I would taste and see that the Lord was good. And the only thing that drew me back to Watertown is I wanted them to taste the water. I wanted them to experience what I experienced. It was... It's the heartbeat of every missionary that gets dropped into foreign soil. Every church planter that goes to foreign soil and there is not an apostolic witness. All they're trying to do is to get the waters of Bethlehem, to get the waters in their land. That is our desire. That is our passion. Thank God that there were three men that were in debt, three men that were in distress, three men that were discontent, and they finally heard the spirit of their leader. And because they heard, they went forth, the Bible says, and they broke through the garrison of the Philistines, and they went to that well, and they scooped up that water, and they brought that water to their leader. We're talking about more than a little. They could have sat there and just listened to the message. They could have sat there and just listened to the decree. They could have sat there and just patted their leader on the back. But something got inside of them. They said, I want to do more than listen to what he's saying. I want to do more than listen to the message that's coming out of his mouth. I got to do more than the bare minimum of just following and listening. I will be going. I will be doing. I will be acting. Acting. Would you lift your hands? Would you lift your voice right now? Would you lift up your voices right now, church? Come on, Eastgate, lift up your voice. Lift up your voice. Lift up your voice. They got that water after fighting a good fight of faith. They had, they, they didn't know the outcome, but something inside them believed it was worth the effort. And they did it, and they fought for it, and they brought it back to their leader, and they hand that vessel to their leader, and David sees that water. And I, I believe he was surprised. He was shocked. He was caught off guard, never realizing that some of those men actually got to that place of spiritual maturity where they were listening to his voice and they were listening to his heart. They didn't mock him. They didn't insult him. They didn't question him. They simply went out and they began to fight to get what he needed and what he desired. And when he got it, he looked at them and he looked at that water and he did something so crazy. He got that. And he just, the Bible says he poured it out before them as an offering, a drink offering to the Lord. And people could say, you know, come up with all different theories and ideas of why and all that kind of thing. But he really, he displayed something so powerful to them. Because some people can mis misunderstand a missions weekend where we're talking about money and you think it's all about money and it's somehow some way we could we could funnel that money into our own uh, desires as a pastor or desires as a minister and and when they brought what he voiced to them he displayed to them this is not about me he poured right back into the land and that's what this is all about this weekend 
This is not about some whatever number ends up going there that you're going to read off next year. That number represents a drink offering that's going to go into a land. We don't drink this because this is the blood, sweat, and tears of men. This is your life. This represents your time. This represents your emotion. This represents your sacrifice. We're not here to drink your blood, sweat, and tears. Your blood, sweat, and tears. We are prayerfully considering what life land can I pour that in where can I invest it so we can have breakthrough so the Philistines no longer have a garrison or a stronghold that prevents people from drinking from the well of Bethlehem I believe that when we begin to pour out before the Lord for the land we are going to access the waters of Bethlehem we are going to access Would you clap your hands to the Lord? Will you elevate your voice above your hand clap? Will your voice be louder than your hand clap? Hey! <laughs> Woo. The Bible says that these men, these three men that were in debt, in distress, and discontent, they are no longer identified as such. Right after that, it declares them as the three mighty men of David. When we begin to align with the voice and the desires of our leadership in spiritual covering, God can transform your identity. You no longer have to live in a poverty spirit, a poverty mentality, a victim mentality. God can transform you into a victor. God can transform you in more than a conqueror. You can start walking different. You can start praying different. Genesis 24 verse 10. We okay tonight? I don't even know what time. I think I started like at 730 so I think we're okay. Maybe. Genesis 24 verse 10. I want to read through a story. I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to hurry as fast as I can. Hallelujah. I know you're tired, but I got up at 2.45 to get here. And it was a rough day. The Bible says, in this context of Scripture, you have Abraham who's about to die. He wants to make sure his son Isaac is married correctly. And the Bible says that Abraham gets his servant. and says, I need you to, to get a wife for my son. So finally the servant goes. In verse 10, he takes 10 camels, the camels of his master, And all of a sudden, he begins to make this journey, this travel. And he goes by a well in verse 11, at the time in which women would come out to draw water. Verse 12, we read read this prayer that he begins to pray. Oh, Lord God of my master Abraham, I pray, send me good speed this day. It's a good prayer to pray. God, I need a good day. I could use a good day today. I'm standing by the well of the water. The daughters of the men of the city are about to come out here, God. Verse 13, verse 14. And let it come to pass, the the damsel that I say, that I speak to, let down your pitcher that I may drink. Let that woman, that damsel, that woman, when she she says drink and I will give your camels drink also. Let that be the signal that she's the one that you have appointed to be the wife of Isaac. Verse 15, it came to pass before he had done speaking that behold, Rebekah came out. That doesn't always happen that way. But it's pretty cool moments when you're praying and God answers before you even say, in Jesus' name, amen. This happens right here. Before he finishes his prayer, Rebecca comes out. And all of a sudden, she's got that picture on her shoulder. Verse 16, she's beautiful, very fair to look upon. She's pure. And, And all of a sudden, the Bible says that a servant goes to meet her in verse 17. And he says this to her, let me, I pray thee, drink a little water of your pitcher notice he didn't ask for much he just said I can I have a little makes no we know what he prayed but he does not mention to her anything about the camels needing something to drink all he asked Rebecca is can you give me a little 
water. And she said, drink, my Lord. And she hasted. She didn't contemplate. She didn't wait. She just did it. And she puts her pitcher down that well upon her hand and gets that water and comes to him and gives him drink. In verse 19, after she had done giving him drink, she says to him, I will draw water for your camels also until they have done drinking. She did more than a little. She went beyond minimum expectations. She declared, not only will I give you a little to drink, I'll give your camels to drink, but I'll, I'll keep giving them drink until they're finishing their drink, until they quench their thirst. That may not seem like much until you just read a little bit about camels, and I'm not a camelologist. But just from the little I read about camels, depending on the age, depending on the type, a camel can drink anywhere in one setting from 20 gallons of water to 50 gallons of water in under 10 minutes. How many camels did she have or he have? 10. So let's just say they're 10 baby hobbit camels. And they only can get 20 gallons in them. What's 20 times 10 homeschoolers? Well, not homeschoolers, a real school. No, I'm just kidding. My kids are homeschooled. They can't read or write either. So. What's 20 times 10? 200 gallons. There wasn't a spigot to turn on. It was a heavy pitcher that carried whatever amount depending on what, how strong of a woman she was. But let's just say there's five gallons in there. I struggled bringing two gallons of milk in one hand from the garage to my wife from Walmart. 200 gallons. We don't know the distance to that well, but let's just say it's right there. But every time she had to let that pitcher down, pull that up and how is this say she got five gallons each time that is a lot of drawing a pitcher down a well pulling up and then pouring into a trough and waiting until all 10 camels meet their thirst it's quenched all taken care of I would venture to say it was probably more than 200 gallons but even at that that is what she opened herself to she simply could have said look it's late I gotta get home I don't know you you're a stranger I don't know what land you're from you're a foreigner I don't know you I'm just gonna take care of me and mine but all of a sudden she met his need and she met the need of all those camels she went above and beyond minimum expectations we live in a society that does a minimum ex what how low of a grade can I get till I pass this course how many little of hours can I work so I have this job what's the least I can do to get a promotion what's the least I can do to be a member of this church what's the minimum requirement for me to get to heaven come on apostolic we cannot live lowering the bar saying well it's just a day of grace I'm gonna relax no the need is great the hour is dire and there is a thirst that needs to be quenched Oh, would you clap your hands to the Lord and will let your voice rise above the applause to the Lord God Most High. Let's 
uh, I don't know you I don't know what your personal motive is for being here maybe your minimum expectation that you're meeting is just to be here for the services because your favorite preacher might be preaching one of them I, I hope the Holy Ghost gets a hold of your heart before this weekend's finished and you do more than a little because a call to action is going to come and if we're ever to go beyond, you got to go beyond the minimum requirement and level of expectation. And she so gracefully met his need and the need of 10 camels without an ever loving clue of what he prayed and what he was going to do. And all of a sudden, he pulls out the treasures. <laughs> starts blessing her motive matters by the way I, I, I do believe given it shall be given but I, I believe more than just giving grudgingly or of necessity it was said earlier today God loves a cheerful giver listen this is my personal prayer God I, I don't want to give to get I want to give because you gave we can turn offering and missions into a money-making scheme. Well, if I get, I'll get a double for my treble. I'll get a triple for my ripple. If I put this much down, I'll get this much back. No, we want to give because there is need. We want to give because there is the lost. We want to give because somebody has been wandering through a desert land, a dry land, and they have not tasted the waters of the well of Bethlehem. Not only does she get treasure, the Bible says the proposal is made to her to be married to Isaac. Little did she know that that act of going beyond little, doing more than a little, more than minimum expectation, she was blessed financially and she was blessed with posterity and she would be the instrument God used to birth the nation of Israel without Rebekah there is no Israel because of a woman meeting the need of a person in a foreign land that she never met before all of a sudden she burns the promise she burnt ah, ah, there's no telling what can happen today and tomorrow and the next day if you give yourself to this mission conference God can use you to birth a nation that does not have an apostolic witness I believe every nation is going to have an apostolic witness. Every nation. Oh. Two verses and I'm done. Proverbs 25, 25. His cold waters to a thirsty soul so is good news from a far country what you're doing this weekend is you're going to bring cold waters to a thirsty soul people ask all sorts of questions how we had breakthrough and how we had revival man it was it was 15 years before we we, we hit the the hundred barrier and uh it was and the promise god gave me was terry in watertown till pentecost and it was on the day of pentecost at 15 years that we finally cracked. I'm not saying like hundreds of magic number, but it just definitely does something for the mind. And man, and then God started dealing, dealing with me. And he said, Mark, you're comfortable. Comfortable? How do you get comfortable in South Dakota? And he used my friend Chris Green in the service. He's preaching. And he shared this story about preaching at or not preaching, he was just he was at this uh, tent revival during the riots in, in Portland, Oregon. And, and, and this charismatic, this, this ministry group that didn't even have the full truth is having a tent revival outdoors and people are getting the Holy Ghost and God protected that tent revival from the rioters that are trying to encroach on his wild. And he said the Lord spoke to him and said, they're doing more with less and you are doing less with more. They have less truth and are making more sacrifice and you have more truth and you are making less sacrifice 
And man, it was like a spear, a harpoon from heaven hit me and smote me to the ground. And I, I tried to have that attitude like Rebecca and make haste. The Bible says she ran. She ran back and forth. I guess you would. You got to give 200 gallons of water to the camels. But she made haste. Another friend of mine made this point. He said, at some point, delayed obedience becomes rebellion. So I turned to the associate pastor and said, see ya, it's yours. And we started all over again. And you know, currently in the past year and a half, we've planted three churches. I'm pastoring three church plants. Otherwise, I hang out with you this weekend, but I got work back in the land. In just the past couple of years, we went from being six works to 14 works in South Dakota. Now, I'm not bragging. I'm not, don't misunderstand me. How There's 66 counties in our state that do not have apostolic truth. And my prayer is before I die or before Jesus comes back, I just want there to be a light on in every county. I want to reduce the distance it takes for people to find truth. And that's, I give honor to our missionaries, church planners, mission works that might be represented in this room. We got to get reminded every year of what we're doing here and why you're doing it. I don't want to do little. I want to sacrifice. I routinely read books of our elders, our pioneers, Windross, Bill Dross, Elton Bernard, and, and uh, uh, Nona Freeman, and, and Benny DeMerchant, and I can just keep going on and on about this various stories. It just blows my mind. Read them. Oma Ellis, that man, that, that, that book will just mess with your head. Powerful pioneers that went across this country just starting work after work after work. We're, I listen to stories of Bobby Wendell. Oh my goodness. What they did there in Africa, it just blew my mind. And, and I'm just realizing I have yet to even touch the tip of sacrifice. And so tonight, we're not doing the offer. I believe it's Sunday, but what I want us to do is if you got the heartbeat of saying, God, I want to do more than a little. I know I'm, well, this cup's going to represent what you're going to do this weekend. And you may feel like I'm just going to give a little to missions. I'm going to do a little something. And if that's all you do, God bless you. I'm not saying you're going to hell. But the task that is at hand requires more than a little. I really felt prompted. And I, I, I'm not saying I prophesy. I'm not saying I have a word of knowledge. But I, felt pro, I, I just felt very very prompted that there's 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 some vessels in this room that it's more than money that you're going to commit to God I really believe there's some missionaries in this room I have no idea who you are and if I'm wrong I'm wrong and pastor clean up aisle seven but if you are willing to go above and beyond the minimum see is this money, it may not, I, people ask me, what, 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 what did you do to have breakthrough? What did you do to have revival? How this happened? And there's something I don't talk about very often because it sounds so cheap or cold or callous. I don't know. But it's this thing called money. I told you about just a few little glimpses of our poverty and our struggle. I used to be afraid of going to the mailbox because it was demon possessed. I opened it up in Austin and I said, What is your name? Bill, for we are many. <laughs> but something changed. All of a sudden, there was other things that came in that mailbox. There would be checks with letters from people I've never even met before. And we'd be praying, asking God for help, and all of a sudden, there'd be another check. And I, I used to get excited. My wife and I would say, you get to the mailbox first. And all of a sudden, there'd be a miracle offering, a miracle finance, and it wasn't celebrating money. It did provide the need. It did help. But really, we would fall to that floor, and we would just thank God because the Bible says where your treasure is there your heart is also because what you're putting when you sent out to missions that missionary understands that is your heart saying I believe in you I support you I'm in investing in you I am here praying for you you have supported and encouraged countless of hundreds or maybe even thousands of missionaries across this nation across this globe and you have another opportunity here the Bible says in 2nd Chronicles 31 4 has 
Hezekiah, he says, give portion to the priests and the Levites that they might be encouraged in the law of the Lord. He saw there was a gap. There was a vision. There was a mission, but there wasn't provision. And so all of a sudden, he says, we got to provide so the ministry is not discouraged from the mission field. And all of a sudden, the people rallied. They came together. They poured into the vision. And the priests began to rise to the occasion. And they felt the support. And the temple was cleaned. The temple was purified. And revival was had in the days of Hezekiah. I want us to stand together right now. I want us to lift our hands for a moment. I want us to ask that God would speak to us in this time in the altar that we're about to have. Come on, prepare your heart before you even come forward. We're going to have an altar call here in a second. But I want you to get ready. I want you to prepare your mind. Prepare your spirit in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I pray you confirm your word tonight, God. I pray you confirm your word tonight, God. God, I pray you confirm your word tonight, God. Heto ba 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 ta 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 ka ta ta. Rama bo ba 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 ri ya ra ba ba ra re ya ra 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 ba ba ra re ya ra bo ro to ra ya ra ma ra ra re yo ro yo ro. Teta sa ta 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 ta. Allah la 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 ba ha. Allah bo lo lo ro bo ho. If you feel compelled to do more than a little, I want you to come and grab a cup. Make room. Make room. Come on, I want you to come and grab a cup. And you get as close to the altar. You find something in a moment. We're going to pray together, lifting that up as a sign, as an offering of God put into our hearts what we're going to put into this cup that we're going to pour into a land by this coming Sunday when uh, Brother Carpenter preaches and when the faith promise goes forth, God, I pray that we bring more than a little. I pray there's great faith in this house. I pray that cups would run over and in the name of Jesus, nations of promise will be birthed in Jesus' name. Come on, gather quick. Grab a cup as fast as you can. Maybe pass the stacks around. Give people an opportunity. I hope everybody will participate, but I'm not going to force you because your motive, your spirit matters. We're not here to twist your arm. We're here to let you know of a precious opportunity that you can be a part of in the name of Jesus. Come on, pass it around. You got a picture of that white building again? And we were... We were, we were rotten inside of that place. But God, finally, we begin to turn a corner. We begin to have some growth and some breakthrough and revival. And all of a sudden, we, God put something on my heart once there. So we were in, it was in January. We were in the midst of a blizzard, and we were still having church. You should have saw what I drove in to get here. <laughs> we were in a blizzard, and so I was like, we're going to have an altar call. Begin to prophesy to one that God was going to give us a property. You have a picture. It's like a, the big brick one, the asphalt part. Yeah, that one. And so, it wasn't like that on the day we got there, but we, we began to go around that building. We laid hands on that door, and it was sub-zero temps. It was a blizzard, and we anointed us a God, I believe you're going to give this to us debt-free. It was estimated $1.3 million property, almost four acres of land. We, we, we only had like, uh, I don't know, 20 people, 25 people counting babies, and, and we counted those that looked like they were pregnant with twins. We added that to the number. Attendance begins at conception in home missions. But we begin to declare in Jesus' name. And all of a sudden, I, 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 I can draw out the details, but I don't have time. I preach long enough. But long story short, we made an offer on that building. And we didn't have the money. But in three weeks' time, the cup started coming in. We didn't take a loan, but 250000 cold glasses of water came in and on the day of closing we set a closing date and we didn't have the money we did it by faith and on that day after all the cups came in after all the cold refreshing water we got that building debt free walked into it and that's where we begin to have revival and growth and breakthrough and now the Jesus Church Pastor Jared's leading that congregation in a powerful way and we're out just doing the same thing we just started in another town we got a picture of another church 
That one was just given to us. No, no cold cups of water or nothing. Before we met one person, before we had one Bible study, a historical society just gave us that building because we decided, you know what, we want to reach beyond the borders. We want to go to regions beyond reach. But that miracle never would have happened if we just didn't step out. That miracle happened because we stepped out by faith. And I think that thing was like a bat cave. There's a whole lot of problems in there. But all of a sudden, guess what? More cups of water started coming in. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to pray, God, what is it that you want me to put in this cup this weekend? And I want to go above little. I want to go beyond minimum expectations. Would you lift your hand and lift that cup before the Lord? And I want you to begin to pray. I want you to lift your voice. I'm not going to push you in this altar call. I'm going to step away from this platform in just a moment. But I want you to pray. I don't know if it's going to be five minutes. I don't know if it's going to be 15 minutes or 50 minutes, whatever it is. I want you to begin to pray right now that this would be a different weekend for you all. Some of you, this is your favorite weekend every year. Some of you, it's just been a tradition. But God is trying to bring you back to a place to remind you of what this is all about. There is a couple right now that is depressed. There are some people that are barely making ends meet. There are some missionaries. They simply just need some help right now. And God is strategically appointing this weekend and this congregation to be ready to bless a multitude, to bless a new land, a new nation. In the name of Jesus, help us to be sensitive to the Holy Ghost. In the name of Jesus, I pray, God, that you would open up our hearts and open up our hands and let there be a release. That's it. Lift your voice. Lift your voice. That's it. Pray, pray, pray. That's it, that's it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of you need to put your heart in that cup right now. God, I'll even do the ultimate sacrifice. Lord, I'll put nothing off the table right now. Everything's on the table, God. Lord, if you need a worker, if you need an aimer, God, if you need, Lord, a new missionary, God, I'll do anything you want me to do. God, I'll give anything because I know the urgency of the hour. Here am I. Here am I. Here am I.